Now to introduce our closing keynote presentation, please welcome to the stage planning committee and board member Kay Bender. So have you enjoyed the conference? We have had, um, I think, I'm a little biased, but three wonderful days with sessions that have challenged us to think about health equity and social justice. Throughout the sessions, as we were looking at the questions coming up from the audience, invariably in each session, we would get a question or a comment, so how do we implement strategies both at the individual nurse level and at the institutional level and then certainly at the academy level during these tough, challenging, turbulent political and social times. Well, boy, do we have a deal for you. <laughs> Our last uh, session, we were looking for someone who could both moderate this provocatively and who could speak to it. And who better to moderate than uh, Dr. Angela McBride, who I know all of you know as a living legend and as a past Academy president. Angela, you can come on up to the podium. Uh, D distinguished professor and university dean Emer emeritus from Indiana University. Dr. McBride will serve as our moderator. And I can tell you, she has some really interesting things that she has observed this week that she'll be uh, bringing to this. And then we said, so welcome. And then we said, who would be a great speaker? Who could bring 19 years of service on Capitol Hill? Um, who's been an executive dean at the Kennedy School of Government? Who was deputy director and then COO of the Smithsonian Institution when the uh, Museum for American Indians was opened? Who provides strategy advice to Baker Donaldson now? And who's our new chair of the Institute uh, for Nursing Leadership? So I'm pleased to uh, call to the podium, to the stage, Sheila Burke. Uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conference. And I um, think that we've had some really good, open, frank uh, talk. I think the sessions covered a broad array of subjects. And we are really fortunate to have with us Sheila Burke. I've been one of your groupies, and you don't know it. <laughs> But I have, uh, just from afar, been dazzled by what you have done. And I know you're going to give us some beginning comments, and then the two of us are just going to get into a conversation. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I, uh, I have been your groupie uh, for a long time as well, uh, as I am for many of the folks in the audience. Um, as I reflected back on uh, what sort of um, got me engaged in sort of policy and um, helped me with my career. Uh, people like Thelma Shore, uh, who many of you may know and uh, who was a dear friend, is a dear friend, uh, and Faye Abdullah, um, who was my sponsor to come into the academy. Uh, I mean, we are surrounded by remarkable people and by remarkable leaders and it is um, our responsibility to really take advantage of that. Uh, so thank you, and thank you for allowing me to spend a few moments with you. Um, as Angel suggested, I'm gonna make uh, some remarks and then we will engage in a conversation. Um, but we are truly gathered at a remarkably challenging time, uh, a time of domestic turmoil, uh, for sure, a uh, time of international unrest, uh, and a time of deep political division. Uh, and you need not be physically here uh, to have observed that, I'm sure. 
Uh, we are, in fact, a profession that people often turn to in, terms, in times of uncertainty. Uh, we're a trusted source of information uh, in many respects, uh, and we are, in many cases, that bridge over troubled waters. Uh, if I can sort of call on a reference from my days in San Francisco. Um, we won't go back there. Uh, <laughs> the fact that my university was two blocks from Haight-Ashbury give you some context. Um, but the frequency of our elections, uh, the play between the executive branch, the legislative branch, uh, increasingly the judicial branch, uh, and the states res really result in the absence of a single voice on many of the issues that we care about. Uh, the ever-present special interest, or advocate if you prefer to call them that, uh, and of course the public are all contributors uh, to the conversation that we are having. Uh, in the case of healthcare, in the case of nursing, the terms of our license, the role that we play, who we care for, uh, who funds our care, uh, what we're permitted to do uh, depends in many cases on politics uh, and policy uh, and engage all of those stakeholders in those decisions. Uh, this was made clear to me when I was still in nursing school uh, and active in the Student Association. Uh, the question of the funding of the Nurse Training Act at that time was an issue of concern. Uh, when I first graduated uh, and went to practice at Alta Bates in Berkeley, um, the scope of practice in California, uh, it was the, I was involved in the first strike in the state of California uh, that occurred at that time about the terms of our practice and terms of our, our hours. Uh, we were then, and even more so today, deeply divided over a host of issues in healthcare. Uh, over the course of 200 years, the role of the government has uh, evolved from a fairly concentrated provider of resources the VA, DOD, Social Security, uh, and a protector of the public health with the FDA, with CDC, uh, to now a major financial underwriter of the business of healthcare in this country. Uh, there is growing interest uh, in what the government does um, and what they have in mind, and there is little that we do uh, or the patients and people we care for who are not impacted by those decisions. Uh, in the case of the states, the application process for nursing and educational programs, the state practice acts that govern our practice, our licensure requirements, uh, the presence or absence of nurse licensing compacts, the extent of coverage under Medicaid, state mandated insurance benefits are all things that we care about. At the federal level, the VA, the DOD, Medicare coverage all play a role in our professional lives. Before 1903, all that we cared about, or the only issue, was really the requirement of the registry uh, for those who'd been trained, North Carolina being the first state to create the first board of nursing uh, and enacted a Nurse Practice Act. Of course, now that's been followed by all the other states. Uh, licensure was and is a tool to define our practice, um, to prevent unqualified individuals from practicing. And of course, while the scope has expanded, there are still state specific, and we know only too well the barriers that continue to exist. There are a host of other laws and regulations at the federal level, drug safety, Medicare benefits, uh, that really are a variety of efforts that essentially um, at the federal and state level to look at the practice of care in this country. The government at all levels has an obligation to protect its citizens. These efforts and the broader health care and regulatory issues are significant uh, and much wider than nursing, as we all know, uh, and is reflected in a long list of federal laws and regulations. Health policy has been described as encompassing political, economic, social, cultural, social determinants of individuals and populations, things that are near and dear to our hearts. Uh, it's also been called one of the most complex sectors of the U.S. economy. Even our president has acknowledged that it is complicated uh, to deal with health care. The complexity, which is driven by a host of things, it's driven by innovation, it's driven by intervention, a myriad of stakeholders, uh, has resolved in, resulted really in a call for evidence uh, about what works best for whom, 
uh, in order to inform our decisions about care that will result in safe, efficient, effective, uh, and affordable services. Uh, as many of you know, in 2008, Don Berwick uh, called on us and described the triple aim of healthcare, improving population health, improving patient experience of care, and reducing per capita costs. Uh, easily understood, very tough to do so. Uh, the framework aligned with a lot of what occurred in the context of the ACA and much of the innovation that has occurred since. But while issues of quality and access are critical, many of the measures that preceded the ACA and a number of elements of the ACA were born largely out of macroeconomic concerns. And of course, much of the attention at the federal level has been on the entitlement programs. Uh, looking forward, should we continue at our current pace? We're spending 28% of our budget on Medicare and Medicaid. We're spending 25% on Social Security, which leaves very little else for all of the other priorities, things like CDC, things like NIH, things like uh, essentially all of the other services that the government is expected to provide. Uh, we know the spending is not achieving its goals, um, certainly in terms of the health of the nation. Uh, every year, the United States, uh, appearing in health rankings, uh, tend to be at the bottom. Dozens of countries have longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality. Uh, the progress has been quite uneven. Uh, between 92 and 2006, female mortality actually rose in four out of 10 counties in the United States. At the same time, we spend double the per capita amount that other wealthy nations do. Uh, our expenditures that are in excess of two and a half trillion dollars on healthcare have caused many to ask, why are we spending that amount and whether we're getting what we're paying for? Uh, so the tasks that are before us that uh, we have talked about over the last couple of days uh, and, and worry about are how to provide the best care at the lowest cost and make it equitably available, how to foster a culture of health, and how to invest in research uh, that pro really holds the promise for a new understanding of what matters. Uh, but the overriding issue for Congress has been and will continue to be the budget. Uh, there are a host of reasons that our costs are growing, not the least of which is the silver tsunami. Uh, as we consider the challenge before us in the cost of caring for the old old, which is the fastest growing age cohort, those over the age of 85, uh, those with chronic illness, will all demand our attention. Uh, and while we have a history and a knowledge of prevention, we also have a unique understanding of the management of the chronically ill. Uh, individuals and institutions, and increasingly people in the community, uh, is an area where we can make an enormous contribution. Now, one would imagine that this reality of what we're facing uh, would drive to a consensus among members of Congress, the stakeholders, and the public. Uh, but when asked about the most important issues facing our country, access to health care, cost of care, the manage of the chronically ill, rarely come above 10th or 12th in terms of the interests and things that people are caring about. Uh, when issues related to health care come up, there are often deep, deep divisions between the political parties. Uh, what we see in every tracking poll uh, is a consensus around, for example, the high cost of drugs, but little consensus about what to do. So these stark differences make it enormously difficult to drive change, and from our perspective, tough to get the attention on the issues at the top of our agenda in terms of health care. Uh, there is a real fundamental difference of opinion over what the fundamental role of the government should be. Uh, is it our responsibility as a government to provide coverage, to provide access, to hold down costs, and what do we mean by coverage? An issue that will continue to come up. Lots of changes that we need to make to improve our health care. Uh, the good news is the health care challenges mean that policymakers, health care systems, opinion leaders, payers, uh, and consumers have an opportunity to make a real difference. Uh, our goals are the same as a profession, to improve quality, to reduce costs, to improve our return on investment, to improve health care outcomes. All good news for people uh, and the populations that we serve. We know that change is occurring. Uh, there is a movement, however, an influence from providers to the payers. 
uh, to essentially those who pay the bills and essentially consumers, which is a good thing, uh, in the form of the purchasers of care, businesses and industry, uh, employer benefits and how they're structured, third-party payers. Uh, and so as we look to the future, the question for us is where is nursing? Uh, what can we do to contribute to the solutions to the problems? And how can we be full participants in that process? Uh, in 2015, there was a terrific piece that was published in Policy and Politics in Nursing. Uh, and note was made that the study of health policy is an indispensable component of professional development in nursing. Uh, whether it is undertaken to advance a healthier society, whether it's to promote a self-health uh, care system, or just really to support our ability to provide services. Uh, just as Florence Nightingale understood the politics of her time, just as Clara Barton understood the politics of her time, uh, we need to understand and participate in the politics of our time. Uh, we are at the center of many of the innovations that we rely on to increase access, improve quality, and contain costs. Uh, we have strong clinical and leadership skills uh, that can promote wellness, uh, developing new models of care, uh, publishing the results, and helping to make that case. And in some cases, protecting the access to services. Thursday's announcement with respect to reproductive services is another challenge for all of us to face. With national attention focused on ways that produce better outcomes, uh, and reduce costs, the movement to from a fee-for-service model to a capitated or a global payment system, uh, again, provides us some terrific opportunities. We have an unprecedented opportunity, in my view, to participate in those discussions and to help lead that transition. Uh, but healthcare opinion leaders in 2010, when polled, um, suggested that nurses fell short uh, of their ability to influence that process. Uh, one, the note was made that too many nurses chose not to lead, they preferred to follow, uh, and that with over 120 different organizations, uh, nursing failed in many cases to have a single voice uh, on issues that mattered. Now, reaching that united front is no easy feat, as all of us know. It is human nature to view things from our own perspective. Uh, but if we can develop a strategy that looks at the larger environment, I think we can, in fact, find common ground. Messaging is critical to that, uh, and the development of a strategy has to be based on research that we can defend. But communications can be tough. Uh, an example I will give you uh, is a conversation between a lawyer and her client. The lawyer begins by asking the man, do you have grounds? The man responds, yes, about three acres. The lawyer asks, do you have a grudge? The man responds, no, we don't have a garage, we have a carport. The lawyer, feeling increasingly frustrated, let me try again. She says to the man, does your wife beat you up? The man responds, no, we both get up at about the same time. <laughs> at this point, the lawyer is feeling really frustrated and finally asks the man, do you want to divorce your wife? No, he says, she wants the divorce because she claims we can't communicate. <laughs> so therein lies our challenge. Uh, we, as the largest providers in the nation, largest group, can in fact communicate to the public how nurses can in fact make a difference in the delivery system. Um, and there was never a better time to do so than to do so now but we are absolutely facing unbelievable challenges. We'll never have all the information that we need, but we have to be sufficiently prepared when confronted with questions that must be answered. In God we trust, all others bring data, which is a quote from Deming, suggested that data can help see others realize the results of our work. Uh, but in the political world, data, if understandable, and if it can be applied to real world problems, can help move an issue through the political process. There is a long history of federal efforts to compile data to support policy changes, but the efforts are often slow and often a long time to come to conclusions. Research can be helpful in casting a light on the problem that a myriad of people face. It can also highlight the weaknesses in a strategy. Research and policy making 
uh, involves the usual suspects in quantitative methodology, randomized clinical trials, uh, although there are fewer opportunities for this gold standard than in traditional bench research. For example, systematic reviews, meta-analysis have become very popular. Uh, they tend to shift among the data that's already available and produce in a timely way information that can inform the policy process. Reports from expert panels, government agencies, foundations, all hold great weight. Uh, think of to err as human, uh, crossing the quality chasm, the debate on quality and how that influenced that decision. The reports led to re regulatory and legislative changes. RWJ, in uh, cooperation with then the IOM, now the NAM, uh, commissioned the now famous study charged with developing recommendations for reconceptualizing nursing service and education within a reformed healthcare system. The final report, which we're all aware of, the future of nursing, leading change, advancing health, led to changes, actually led to real changes at a state level, particularly with respect to practice acts. Nurse managed clinics, health centers that were recognized by the ACA as a practice model that can lead to positive outcomes. A lot of the work done at Vanderbilt with Colleen is a good example of that, but we have not yet funded that initiative. Uh, now we're faced with another effort at the federal level to reduce funding for all nurse training uh, and education across the board. So again, the challenge is upon us in terms of defending what it is that we know makes sense. There are a host of examples of states and data analysis that have been used to support change, uh, but don't forget that the data, as strong as it is, can in fact be overcome by politics. In the early 60s, Loretta Ford helped lead a study uh, that looked at the value of nurse practitioners and others in providing care in rural areas. Um, we are suffering from that same primary care challenge today. Her work, which was remarkable, did not lead to policy changes at the time. Some suggested it was because nursing lacked a unified voice or a coalition for a press for the kind of necessary changes. Uh, they also lacked support from other groups who could participate in that conversation and support what it is that we're doing. So while data is critical, it cannot overcome all the barriers that exist. Demonstrations are another tool. The ACA had a whole host of them, the creation of CMMI. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation gave us an opportunity, again, to look at different methods of providing services and organizing care. Nursing played an enormous important role. It provided the opportunity for us to show the role and leadership of nursing. Caring for people who are duly eligible, Medicare and Medicaid eligibles, uh, often among the sickest, also a target of opportunity, and one where we've also begun to see real change as a result of the organization of those services, in many cases led by nurses and nurse managers. We are deeply interested, <clears throat> not surprising, in providing care in a variety of settings. Uh, public health, community-based care is not a new concept to nursing. It may be to others, but it's not to us. And as we move people out of institutional settings, out of things that occur in boxes, there is an enormous opportunity for nursing, again, to lead the charge. Uh, also among the demonstrations called for in the ACA was Medicare's program for graduate nurse education. The purpose was simply to increase the supply of clinicians uh, who provide health services, a first for Medicare to begin to pay for graduate level nursing education. Those reports are, like, are due to come out soon, like today or soon. Uh, and hopefully will help drive the case for why it is important to fund graduate nurse education, uh, something that we for years attempted to do. Uh, again, the case for nursing has not been necessarily well defined in all settings, uh, notwithstanding the fact that nurses are in fact prepared to provide quality care irrespective of where that care occurs. Uh, we are, in fact, the largest providers of service in this country and have the opportunity and the responsibility to help people understand where and when services can best be provided. We can, in fact, I think, alter the value proposition uh, that's at stake, <clears throat> but we have to seek ways to publicly recognize, to quantify, and to document our contributions in ways that are understandable. 
Uh, it's been said that the challenge for nursing, and this was said for those of you who had the opportunity to be at the leadership um, discussion on Thursday, uh, one of our speakers commented that we want to find a seat at the table and not simply be on the menu, uh, which is exactly the case, which is that we need to find an opportunity for engagement. It is a natural extension of our commitment to the people for whom we care. Every politically active person, uh, including those that have been elected to office, have learned their political and policy skills. Nursing is no different. Uh, there is a certain amount that can be learned through the formal education process, and it ought to be part of our formal education process, but it is really through experience and through practice uh, that you can uh, learn to apply what needs to be done in terms of issues. So I will finish up by listing, essentially, um, my marching orders for all of you. The first is to start at home. Uh, in 2018, every member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election, and 33 members of the United States Senate. There are also a host of governor's races that are open and engaged. Virginia is a good example of a very competitive race. Take a stand, take a role, and get engaged. Find a mentor or be one. Uh, we saw two spectacular examples at the leadership luncheon. Uh, find someone who's done this, or if you have, then find someone you can help educate about how to get engaged in the role that you might play. You learn by doing, as we know in all cases. Uh, asking the tough questions. You know, why, in fact, is a position taken by a particular member? Why is there a particular policy in terms of service? Be informed. Know what you're asking and know what essentially the role is. Uh, many of you have heard me say this before. In all of the town hall meetings that I attended in Kansas, of which there were many, um, it was not unusual for a physician in the community to stand up and identify themselves as a physician. I'm Dr. So-and-so, Senator Dole, you know, here's what I have to say. It was almost, in fact, I can't think of a case where someone stood up and said, I'm a nurse, and I'm providing care in this community, and this is what my patients are concerned about, or this is what I'm concerned about. So asking the tough questions and identifying yourselves, being informed, being a volunteer, all these races, and even if it's city council, if it's mayoral, whatever it happens to be, they are all looking for volunteers. Volunteer to be engaged in their policy process. Be engaged in helping them essentially reach out to their voters or in developing their issue papers. Enormously important. Bringing evidence to the table about why the change you suggest makes sense. Uh, narratives that put a human face on an issue. There is nothing more persuasive than essentially presenting a real world case. We had an intern years ago from Kansas who was a hemophiliac. And we, in the course of our work at the time, Dole was chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, re looked at essentially the availability of EPO. Because at the time, you had to go into an outpatient department of a hospital. And this young man essentially argued, why not, I know myself, my family knows me, why not allow a different set of circumstances to exist? Similar kind of debate over end-stage renal disease, when essentially we moved out of the community-based back into institutional services. Again, the human face on those issues makes all the difference to a member to understand what the challenges are. Be alert to the timing and the windows of opportunity in terms of things that are going forward. We know today, for example, that there's going to be a reauthorization of Title VIII, which funds all the nurse training programs. Now is the time to make the case for why that funding is important and what difference it makes to you in your university, in your setting, to your students, and to your faculty. Uh, the importance of building bridges. Find an advocate. There are strange bedfellows uh, that we can imagine working with, but essentially building that coalition can make an enormous difference, as we've seen others do in terms of supporting their issues. The other thing I learned from Dole very early on uh, I mean, remembering I'm a, I was a Democrat, liberal, San Francisco, uh, went to work for somebody from a state I flew over, uh, didn't know very much about. As I told someone the other day, my idea of rural was Oakland. Um, <laughs> but essentially, uh, what he taught me was to never burn bridges. You don't ever know who you're going to have to go back to to ask for support. So find a way for common ground. There will always be instances where you can't imagine joining with someone, but there is always an opportunity to find common ground. 
So don't ever burn those bridges because inevitably you're gonna go back. Know what you know and what you don't know. Uh, essentially, you know, you make the mistake once, you don't make it twice. Uh, so know what you know, be prepared to discuss it, and don't pretend to know something you don't. And give people information that they then use and are essentially caught on. And then finally, know your audience. You know, I knew my audience, ultimately, with Senator Dole, because I knew the experience he had spending three years in a hospital, you know, had a long history of working with the disabled and others. I knew what his interests were. I knew where he came from, from Russell, Kansas. So I knew the kinds of concerns he had. Know who you're talking to. You know, the guy from, you know, Midtown Manhattan is not gonna be the same guy from Poughkeepsie. So understand what their concerns are and who their constituency is. And again, whether it's at the federal level, the state level, or locally, know essentially what their interests are and draw those interests. So let me finish by reading to you an editorial. Many of you have heard me uh, cite this before, I suspect, but, uh, but it's telling and I think it's even more important today. Uh, it's an editorial from the New York Evening Sun from March the 3rd of 1906. Um, quote, nurses nowadays are instructed in a great variety of topics, and it is a question whether the smattering of knowledge they receive uh, is not more often mischievous than useful. Some of them are too apt to think of their position entitles them to censure the work of the doctor and to carry out his orders or not as they see fit. What we want in nurses is less theory and more practice, but to stuff her head with scraps of knowledge about a number of subjects do not concern her duties at all would surely be foolish. An overtrained and learned nurse is apt to be a nuisance. And on that positive note, thank you. <laughs> Sheila, that was wonderful. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to begin just a little to the side. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about being a staff nurse in Berkeley. And then you were 19 years on the Hill. And you were Senator Dole's chief of staff for 10 of them. And as, as many of, I think most of you know, he was a majority leader of the Senate. And presumably, because he was the leader of the Senate, you in 1995 became the Secretary of the Senate, the Chief Administrative Officer for the United States Senate. I have a reason for going over her bio. It isn't just to tell you how terrific it is to have her now, but just think about, okay, there's Capitol Hill, then she's executive dean of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, which was your alma mater for your master's degree. And then she spent seven years as deputy secretary, then chief operating officer of the Smithsonian Institution, overseeing more than a billion dollars in budget and the opening of the National Museum of American Indians, the new Air and Space Museum, and legislation to create the African American Museum. And uh, she, I, I won't go on, but she's now the chair for government relations and public policy at Baker uh, Don Donaldson. Now, where I'm going with this is, how do you fill out your RN licensure? <laughs> because if you think about, and I just did this recently, and when I was thinking about you, I was thinking, She's got a problem <laughs> because we are still left thinking that what a nurse does has the word nursing in it. Mm. And if you think about all the big issues that you just talked about, they're all interprofessional. They're always boundary mm -hmm. spanning. And I have to tell you that um, I, I've never heard her say this, but I know that nursing has been through a period of shunning nurses as not still a nurse if they didn't have the title nurse in their title. Mm -hmm. And I know that you've dealt, you've dealt with that. And I, you know, first of all, it must have been very lonely. I apologize for the tribe. <laughs> um, but, but if I think about what you got on the keyboards, because you've played a role in policy around Medicare, Medicaid, on the Kaiser Family Foundation, um, uh, chairing that. Um, 
And you have really played such a big role in social change, which is in fact what this conference is about. And yet it's been interprofessional. Um, I, you know, I, I guess where I'm going with this is um, how can we do more so that we get away from this notion of who is the real nurse mm. and that you are the real nurse? The, um, thank you for that. A, a, a couple of things. One, just a small humorous uh, comment. Um, when I ran the Smithsonian, uh, we went through a period of time where we lost a number of animals um, at the zoo. And I am now remembered for having told the director of the zoo at the time that the next thing that died had better be her. So it's not... <laughs> Not entirely clear that my uh, my skills were always uh, were always best uh, used. Um, I have other similar kinds of stories I can share as well. But um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you've hit on a remarkably important point, and that is that we are sometimes our own worst enemy. And when I um, went to the Hill, uh, I mentioned Thelma Shore, who was. Uh, tremendously supportive and encouraged us to identify folks that were on the Hill who were nurses and begin sort of a, you know, a circle of friends uh, to begin to talk with one another. Um, you know, we tend to isolate things we don't fully understand. And I think that has begun to change um, through a host of means, you know, the number of fellows increasingly. Um, I had the opportunity to have Johnson Fellows when I was a staff person. Uh, Marie Micknick was one of my early fellows, uh, and Mick has gone on to do just remarkable things. Um, it is exposure, uh, but it is the responsibility of the individual to identify themselves as a nurse. And you will often get the question that Mary Wakefield uh, noted the other day, which is, you're a nurse, why are you here? Uh, and your ability to essentially explain the kind and understand the kind of skills that you bring. Uh, it is the responsibility of both the individual who's in that policy position as well as traditional nursing to support one another in terms of trying to achieve a goal. But there is no question that we went through a period of time where that was not the case. I, I think it is less the case today, but nonetheless we ought to celebrate uh, those among us who choose to do something different. Uh, whether it's in the public policy process, whether you know, it's in a non-traditional environment in terms of a clinical setting or an educational setting. Um, it is remarkable the number of instances where in talking with someone, you'll identify they had a sister who was a nurse, a mother who was a nurse, an aunt who was a nurse. Uh, and there is a connection there uh, that nursing has and also the skill set. I mean, you, you note the sort of strange career path um, that I had. The thing that was true throughout, whether it was on the Hill, whether it was at Harvard, whether it was at the Smithsonian, um, whether it's today, uh, and that is the skills that we acquire are skills that are applicable irrespective of where you work. They are organizational skills. They are team building skills. They are ability to communicate. It is setting priorities. It's essentially in moving an agenda forward. Um, all of those things are things that we acquired during the course of our uh, education and our practice, and they are applicable irrespective of the, the location that we served in. Um, you know, setting aside the other handy things, the, I will, one other small funny story. Um, we were celebrating the opening of the American Indian Museum, and we had hundreds of thousands of people on the mall, uh, and all the tribes, because it was a tribal uh, initiative. It is a museum that is remarkable in the role that the tribes played. But we had a huge dinner at the building museum the night of the opening of the museum, and I was scheduled to speak. And uh, it was when um, John Kerry was running, and so uh, his wife, Teresa, was seated at a table quite near me uh, with full Secret Service protection and um, a number of other folks. And among her guests uh, was Robert Redford. And so I went off to the bathroom thinking I was about to speak. And my, one of my staff came roaring down the hall and screaming, you've got to come, somebody's choking. So here I am in full black tie. You know, I run back down, and it's a member of Congress who has 
who's clearly choking, who's turned, you know, sort of the blue of our background. And, you know, you do what you do and, you know, did the whole thing, did Heimlich, that didn't remove, so I, you know, stuck my hand down his throat, you know, essentially pulled out a piece of lamb, um, but then did mouth to mouth. And as I'm doing mouth to mouth on this very elderly member of Congress, I looked up and Robert Redford was standing right in front of me. And I thought, there but for the grace of God, I would be giving you mouth to mouth. <laughs> Okay, I have to ask, Many did that things. member of Congress <laughs> listen to you every time you came over that, for the that vote? That member of Congress and his family, he now has a son who's a member of Congress. Uh, they, were very, uh, they were very grateful. Uh -huh. But interesting, side note, the report the next day in the newspaper was that the Secret Service had leapt into action, and of course they can't. Their only role is their protectee. They're not allowed to get engaged with anybody else, and they didn't do a damn thing. And, uh, you know, but there was a Secret Service leap into, you know, saving so-and-so. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Story of my what, life. One of the questions from the audience is, uh, when nursing is a predominantly female profession, how do you make a difference in a political environment that has little re respect for women? And I think that also goes back to the business of being lonely. I mean, a lot of your career, you have been, quote, the only one. And how do you, and a lot of people are undone by that. Do you have strategies for dealing with it? Do you have strategies for? You know, it's being, um, uh, and it, you know, it was a um, somewhat frightening to sit in front of the finance committee at the time, all male, uh, and I was the only female um, on the professional staff at that point. And um, you, you're right, you know, people, and particularly when I was pregnant, I had all my children while I was on the Senate staff, and, you know, these guys kind of vibrate when a pregnant woman walks in the room. Most of them haven't seen one, you know, since their wife had a baby 40 years before. Um, and, it, you know, it, my attitude was to simply be the most well-prepared individual in the world, and absolutely just on point. And, you know, I was lucky I worked for someone who had enormous respect for women um, and who essentially it didn't occur to him to treat me any differently. Uh, and so when I went into a room, you know, he acknowledged me like he did every other member of the staff. Uh, there were members who were not as responsive. Um, and, you know, my response to that was simply to do my job. Um, I was not the subject, thank God, of anything really untoward. Uh, but you certainly saw it happening. And part of that is also, as, a, uh, as an individual, supporting other people in similar situations. So there were a lot of younger staff who were young women who were coming to the Hill for the first time. And it was taking the, making the effort to bring them forward, to essentially bring them into the room, to have them at meetings, to call them out. Um, it, you know, and hiring other staff, you're sensitive to that. Um, so it, in part, our responsibility is to support others. Um, and again, I was lucky that I worked for someone who was remarkably uh, respectful, uh, but it wasn't always the case with others. And it was, again, being prepared. Um, you mentioned reproductive rights mm -hmm. in, in your remarks, and uh, the current, this week, around mm -hmm. re restricting birth control availability. Uh, do you have any advice about particularly, I mean, that issue, I think, whether Republican or Democrat or independent, I think women feel rep reproductive rights, birth control. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, um, I mean, there's a part of me uh, that, um, uh, you know, in Japan, they only got birth control uh, when, in fact, um, the, the, the pills that were given to encourage men to have more forceful, a more forceful presence uh, came into circulation. Um, I'm in over- Is that a size issue or a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Never mind. But, but there's a part of me that says they're not restricting Viagra. Right. And, right. and yet we have this business about birth control. And it seems to me if there's anything but the long tradition of community health nursing, mm -hmm. Margaret Sanger, 
Mm -hmm. do, do you have any ideas, given how lethal this climate is, but how to go, and especially with that particular issue, for us each to be effective, both of as individuals and wherever we're planted, mm -hmm. in terms of the people we know and what we do? You know, this is a, a terrific case of um, the need for um, grassroots uh, and a grassroots initiative. The 18 election um, will give us an opportunity to make our voices heard. What you tend to find in midterm elections is the turnout tends to be very small. Um, the folks that turn out tend to be um, older um, individuals in the community. They tend not to be young people. Um, and what we saw with the Obama administration in the first Obama election was the unbelievable power of young people engaging in the political process. That fell off in subsequent races. But it would seem to me this is an argument and this is an issue. And, and Planned Parenthood has faced this issue. I sat on a panel the other day with someone uh, who commented that you know Planned Parenthood, it, it was an issue about essential health benefits and the issue about, uh, he said, well, you're just talking about abortion and Planned Parenthood. And, you know, and, and my comment was, well, Planned Parenthood really provides enormous resources in terms of preventive services and support for women in terms of reproductive rights and a variety of screening and a variety of other things. Um, it, it takes going after and responding to every single person that makes those kinds of comments. And that occurs locally in every single race, every single commentary, every reach out, outreach to a, to a member. Um, I don't know any of you who've been in New York recently, uh, but in the taxi cabs in New York, in that little thing that shows you whatever the game shows or whatever when you're sitting in the taxi, the last three times I've been in New York City, there has been an ad on that little thing, um, essentially going after Planned Parenthood uh, directly, um, saying, you know, they're, all they do is provide abortion, they provide no screening. I mean, it's an ad in, this, in the bloody taxi cab. Um, you know, there ought to be an outrage. There ought to be an outrage about the presentation of that kind of information. But you've got a chance in 18 for every single member of the House, 33 members of the Senate, um, to essentially raise those issues. And that's where it's going to get fought. Uh, it's going to get fought there. It's not going to get fought, um, you know, through the sort of normal things. But Planned Parenthood was very successful in sort of the essential health benefits. They had folks like Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski and others who stood up and said, no, we're not going to essentially allow you to go after uh, the ACA in this form. That's a, a win at the moment. One hopes it remains a win. But that's a fight that has to be fought locally with every single member ought to be overwhelmed with comments from their community uh, about the role and the risk and the challenges of not providing those kinds of services. Sheila, I, I want to follow that with a larger issue just about the health, because you've done a, at Baker Danielson, if any of you, um, Sheila writes wonderful sort of synopses of where things are. If you Google Sheila Burke, uh, Baker Danielson, and look at, it says under her publications, it's policy mm. briefs, where she does a wonderful policy brief with where things are. And I just wonder if you, we're gonna have another assault on the Accountable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And and then on the other hand, we have a, a, a group of people talking now about universal coverage, which is sort of like over here. Uh, and, and while I think many of us really would like to think that we would have universal coverage because we are, uh, for people having insurance so that they get the access and they get the quality, just from a purely strategic, as we go to our own communities, um, do you have advice about how to handle technically where things are right now? Um, you know, I think you're right. I think the ACA will come back up again, although I think it's <clears throat> not likely to be until next year when they do another budget resolution. Uh, and do another instruction. But um, if you were to ask um, some of my colleagues and some of the folks on the Democratic side, I think they were perhaps not excited that Bernie Sanders chose the timing he chose to announce uh, a single-payer uh, Medicare solution. Um, I think there is a lot of interest in looking at alternatives 
Um, but you'll notice that in the description, there is no indication of the cost or any indication of the pay-fors. Um, and <clears throat> the, one of the things we know, for those of you who, who follow these kinds of issues, Bob Blendon, who's one of my colleagues at Harvard, uh, Bob does a remarkable job of polling on every possible issue you can think of. But one of the things that Bob has polled on for years, and it never changes, is that do you believe that people ought to have health care? Yes. Uh, do you believe that the government ought to provide services to, the, to people? Yes. Are you prepared to pay more to provide for that coverage? No. Almost routinely, every time. So, you know, this battle over the role of the government, what the structure of that needs to be, um, I think there will continue to be issues, particularly if we see the structure of the ACA begin to fail uh, as a result of the failure on the part of the administration to do the outreach, to do the funding, to essentially build up the exchanges. If you begin to see increases in the number of people dropped, uh, if you in fact see an increase, a bump up in terms of the number of uninsured again, um, I think you will see again this conversation about what in fact is the role of the government. I think there's great reluctance in the near term to move to a fully federalized system. Um, you know, the states have a, an interesting set of roles and circumstances and this balance between the states and the federal government and health care uh, is long standing, particularly since the creation of Medicaid. But I think that debate will continue. I don't think it's likely to be solved in the near term. It may play out in 20 and the 20 election. Uh, again, depending on what happens, I think it's incumbent upon us to make efforts to help people enroll, to let them know Medicaid's available, to let them know the exchange plans are available, uh, and to raise those issues. But I think the, the likelihood of, of us turning quickly to an all-payer, all-federal system in the near term is not likely. Mm -hmm. um, this whole conference has been concerned with uh, social justice and, and uh, health equity. And um, I wonder if you had any thoughts about the special responsibilities white women have uh, to speak up, to advocate, particularly in terms of racial equity, health. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I say this because I think too often we expect our minority colleagues to bear the load. Mm -hmm. And I do think since we are largely peopled by white women, that we have a certain kind of responsibility with regard there. I think we have a responsibility as clinicians, um, uh, as well as a community of um, uh, largely Caucasians. I think people are blind to the fact that the statistics um, about the challenges and the disparities of care are overwhelming. Uh, you need only look at mortality rates, you need only look at access issues, you need only look at compliance with drug regimens uh, by category, you need only look at coverage issues by category of racial population, whether it's Latina, uh, whether it's uh, African American, whether it's Asian, uh, the numbers are enormously compelling in terms of the need to target that population. Um, the, um, and you see it geographically um, as well. I mean, if you look at where the highest rates of, un of uninsurance are, they're in Louisiana, Texas, Florida, I mean, that sort of Gulf Coast area. And it's largely people of color. Um, and I think it is incumbent upon us to be aware of, knowledgeable about those statistics. Uh, that there ought to be, I mean, one of, the, one of my lectures in my course is very specifically on that question, which is the, the disparities in health care and what that means in terms of mortality rates, what that means in terms of the presence of chronic illness. I think we need to educate our students about that reality. I think we have a responsibility to speak up and make efforts to reach out. And I think we have a responsibility to support our colleagues who are involved in those issues. Uh, but it is a, a hugely troubling uh, challenge and is one that has continued even as we've made progress, um, although we've, we've begun to see some slowing of progress in terms of mortality rates. But even as we've made some progress in some areas, there is no question that disparity still exists uh, and, is, and is remarkable. It also you know, is a question of where are we providing services? Are we making services available to people? You know, the relationships with our community health centers. Not everybody can take off the day to sort of show up at a doctor's office or a clinic, 
you know, what do we know about how we're providing services in a community and supporting the development of those, those services. Uh, and again, the support of Medicaid, the support of maternal and child health, the support of the child nutrition programs. You know, one of the things under assault currently are the nutrition programs, which is the food stamp program and the WIC program, enormously important to communities, uh, low-income communities writ large, but particularly communities of color. The school lunch program, all critical elements. And there's little intersection. You know, the, the health people tend not to think about all the other, because it's not, it's not an HHS, it's an ag department issue, and we really need to figure out how to connect those pieces, because we know that health is not just about what we do, it's also about housing, about education, about nutrition and food, uh, and we need to figure out a way to essentially integrate those things. Um, you were interviewed for the Bowdoin's uh, George Mitchell archives. Mm. Um, and it was about the collegiality that existed between Bob Dole and George Mitchell, mm -hmm. um, each of whom was the majority leader at various times. And I remember in that interview you said um, that the two of them regarded each other as not my enemy, my opponent. And uh, you know, I just wonder if you have uh, some thoughts more, and I guess I'm going back now to strategy. Um, uh, about, uh, because I think sometimes um, we, f we forget because I think if you did a poll of nurses, they would be more geared to one political party than another. And yet we are a group that needs to appeal to Republicans, Democrats, mm -hmm. independents. And, and, and again, your, um, you, what do you know now? that maybe you even wish you had known earlier, way back when, about how when somebody is an opponent in something, mm -hmm. you keep, I mean, you talked about common ground, but I'm sort of interested in either an elaboration of that or additional things that one has to keep in mind so that you keep in there working with people. You know, it's an enormously um, challenging question, um, in part because there will always be people with whom you have deep division of opinion. Um, that was certainly true for me. I, um, I had a, uh, a particularly challenging time with the, the conservative right wing of the party, and Dole took a lot of grief because I was viewed as sort of a raging moderate. Um, and You were written about in the Washington Post. Uh, 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 Yes. Um, actually, my children at the time, who were relatively young, I appeared on the front page of the New York Times Sunday Magazine. And it was a photograph of me with horns on my head. Uh, and the title of the piece was The Demonization of Sheila Burke. And it was about this conservative issue. Um, but, but it was incumbent upon me to find some areas where we could find common agreement. Um, it, it, what drove to the battle at that time was a debate over welfare reform. But um, it is difficult. You will find that there are people that are, you know, widely divergent on a, ver a variety of issues. You know, there are going to be issues that are absolutely black and white, that are just, you know, there's no way you can come together. But the majority of the kind of work that we are involved in tends to be gray. Um, and so the question is, can you in those areas of gray agree to disagree? Are there areas in the gray area where you can and find kind of common cause, whether it's education funding or access to service, whatever it happens to be? Uh, but there will be times. Uh, I mean, there were times when Dole and Mitchell and Dole and Byrd and Dole and Daschle, all of whom served together uh, as leaders, would find absolute areas that they could not agree. Um, it was a respect for the other person's position. It was acknowledging that that difference existed, and it was looking for those, those few areas where you could find common cause. Um, it, it appears much more challenging today because people tend to be, I mean, you tend to see the extremes rather than the middle, and in the Senate in particular, the middle's gotten pretty mm -hmm. small. Um, but it's, it's, even if you think about what's going on today, CHIP, the Child Health Insurance Program, an area where there's been historically bipartisan support. You know, you, you see Alexander and Patty Murray trying to find common cause. 
uh, in stabilizing the insurance market. They recognize deep divisions on the ACA, but they're trying to find common cause on stabilizing the markets. Um, so you look for that gray uh, where you can that allows you to find some common agreement and then agree to disagree, but be respectful of the other person's position. Uh, I, uh, the light is blinking. I would love to talk to you more. First of all, I want to just thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. For our profession and our country. Thank you. And I, I also want to say, um, Ralph Smith, who was the alpha to this conference, and Sheila Burke, who was the omega, <laughs> Both had Jesuit education because you're a baccalaureate. Go Jesuit. And I would say that, you know, that social justice, health equity background as part of, because he talked about the fundamental, I mean, everything that you say. It's that 16 years of Catholic education. Comes through. Got me through. And um, I, I think the other final thing I want to say is I've heard a lot of times myself about what will the academy do to forward policy? What will it do? And we talk about as if the academy were this, you know, Cheryl says it's only 10 people and they have a lot of stuff to do, including running conferences. I mean, really, the academy's um, real forcefulness in policy is us taking seriously, Sheila, about what each one of us is going to do wherever we're planted with the people. Um, these are people of influence. Mm -hmm. The people that we're with, getting them wherever they are planted to, in fact, keep moving forward um, equity and justice issues. Thank you so much, Thank Sheila. You.